Hello everybody and welcome back to the Two Narries podcast. I am your host James and I'm joined by my good friend Timmy Long. Hi everyone. Rowan is on the deck, say hi Rowan. Hi Rowan. And this week's guest is Dylan O'Mahony, a hot shot barrister, but we'll get into that. But you're actually a fan of the podcast too, aren't you? And Thank you've come you. to our live show. I have. Thank you. How are you Thank keeping? Thank you for the introduction. I'm keeping very well. Delighted to be here. Delighted to be asked to be here. And I am, I should say, a massive fan of the two Naris I've been following, you know, since yeah. the start. And um, only got to know you, James, recently. But of course, Timmy will know me from various yeah. episodes, including Brian Brewbridge, <laughs> honking. Are you the guy from the two Naris? <laughs> and then the day I was on the lookout for a good yeah. cream cake and yeah. I was, ended up in Brackens on the old Mallow Road and there he was. I and was sitting, uh, yeah, sitting down having a sandwich and... Uh, late for work, I'd say. I kept yeah. him talking so yeah. long. I, and you know what? You don't see me really getting that much time to sit down and have a sandwich yeah. with, mm. with work. But yeah, you were with your friend and... We did a and great we, chat. We were chatting for... For 10 15 minutes, yeah. Um. I was a bit starstruck. <laughs> <laughs> I seen you on the telly. Yeah. I seen Thank you on the telly. Um, yeah. You were in a, you, you do big court cases, is that fair to say? Yeah, I would have been in a few high profile cases, I suppose, in recent months. Yeah, um, I'm practicing in medical negligence, so the work is it's tough, it's very difficult um, in lots of different ways, and I'm always. Um, you know, I deal with people who've been harmed uh, by the healthcare system uh, or people who've lost a loved one due to um, medical errors. So, yeah, it's very tough. And um, some of those cases do attract a lot of media attention, um, which can be, I suppose, a good thing in one way because yeah. it draws to light the things that can go wrong. And I suppose one would hope that it could lead to improvements and learning. Yeah. yeah. Do you know when you're going up against the HSE, are you going up against the mighty the might and resources of a whole nation, the state? And is that daunting and is it something that I don't know, you get better at over time or mm -hmm. um, how how does it feel you're a young barrister and you're going up against the HSE and like the HSE are notorious for pulling out all the stops. Mm, absolutely. What's it like? Well, what's it like? I suppose it depends on who you ask. Yeah. Um, but what I'd say is, you know, it's my job. Um, mm -hmm. I do what I do and I love it. Um, but it is it is difficult. It is a bit of a David and Goliath situation because the HSC have unlimited resources, mm -hmm. you know, and they have access to funds to defend a case tooth and nail. And then when you might have somebody who's been seriously injured, you know, has life-altering uh, damage, you know, they very, very often don't have money, they're mm -hmm. very limited means, you know, they mm -hmm. can't get legal aid to bring a case, it costs a lot of money to investigate whether they have a case, and um, so there's a lot of work that goes in behind the scenes um, before anyone's case like that even gets off the ground, and when it does, it can be a battle, you know, there is a kind of, mm -hmm. there's a perception of a culture of delay and deny and defend and I suppose as somebody who's in it um, I think it's it's improving ever so slightly yeah. nowadays I think that there's more of an appetite to settle cases earlier which is in everybody's best interest but it's very hard when you're acting for somebody who might be very unwell and um, very sick they mightn't even have long left um, and they are they are up against the might of the state so I suppose I would say to answer your question, for me, it's 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 not difficult. It's just what I do mm. but for the people. Yeah, yeah it's, it's very, very hard. Yeah, because you're probably going up against the HSC and these other organisations weekly or monthly or whatever, mm -hmm. and you're getting used to it, and you're probably getting confident now with, with winning a few cases, you mm -hmm. know, and when you're dealing with people who are vulnerable, which in the yeah. case a lot of them are, Mm. And a lot of them may have health issues as well. Imagine mm. somebody with health issues sitting in a court, maybe, how long do these cases go on? A week? Oh, Two weeks? A month? If these you know? cases go on, some of them can go on for, for weeks. Mm. You know, I'm in cases there, then we'd be calling them on for six weeks. You know, you might have that many expert witnesses. You know, and in the case of, say, a, a child with a disability, as well as the actual experts to deal about, you know, liability and the facts, You'll have all of these other experts, like the therapists, the nursing care experts, the whole range of them, um, 
to talk about, you know, the, the, the quantum side of it or how yeah. much care the person will need going forward. In addition to all of that, the HSC will have the same experts themselves. Mm. So uh, you could be talking weeks if the case is run. Now, the majority of cases settle, but uh, if they do get to court, they can take a very long time mm. and they're very expensive. Yeah, I can imagine. Can I ask you a really basic question? Of course you can. What's the difference between a barrister and a solicitor? That's a great question, <laughs> because no one ever, ever no. knows the answer. I get that a lot. Um, but I suppose here in Ireland, there's two branches of the legal profession. You have the solicitor and the barrister. The solicitor is, I suppose, the person who does more administrative uh, work. They interface with the client. Um, they sort of build the file and they handhold them throughout the process. Whereas the barrister is the one that you probably know as wearing the white collar yeah. and the black gown and sometimes the wig as well on their head. And the barrister is the person who's in court and doing mm. more of the advocacy and um, the, making the legal argument. You yeah. also get paid more money out there as well, James. <laughs> um, <laughs> we won't ask her that now. We should have actually known that. The answer to that question. Well, I, I kind of did, but I just wanted Dylan yeah. to explain it. But mm. a few weeks yeah. ago, a few yeah. weeks ago, I was in the High Court myself yeah. oh, right. because under the Charities Act, uh, <coughs> one cannot be a director of a charity if one has previous convictions. That's I'm right. using my uh, yeah. my my language here or not. Yeah. So, um, but I had a lot of dealings with the solicitor. But when the court case was actually being heard, it was then I met the barrister in the court, and mm -hmm. he was dressed all formally and went through that process. And that was the first and last time I seen the barrister. So yeah. it was everything was kind of done with the sister, but then that main piece then is with the barrister. Mm -hmm. Plus then, uh, in our experiences then of criminal court, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it was always the district court would be the solicitor would represent you. Yeah. But if you were yeah. lucky enough to go for trial or if you were appealing something, then you would have the barrister in the circuit court. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. How did you get into law? Have you got a family history in law? Well, I do. Um, my father is a very well-known and successful barrister, Dr. John, as he's known. Hi, oh, John. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I wouldn't say that it was necessarily a vocation. I think that um, I kind of fell into it, if I'm mm. honest, really, because I was very quiet. I was very shy growing up. I liked reading and writing. And I had this perception of what it was to be a barrister or to be a lawyer and I thought you had to be really smart and great at arguing and debating uh, but also sort of larger than life um, outgoing mm. uh, personality and I just didn't think I was any of those things and um, so it wasn't really something that I necessarily wanted to do which just ended up getting the points for it it was on my CAO and I kind of drifted into it but it's 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 sort of one of those things it's like that's where destiny played its game because you know I'm really really happy and fulfilled now with what i do and i know that it was the right thing yeah. for me but back then i i didn't i didn't mm. know does do you have to become a solicitor first and then a barrister or can you go straight to the barrister go you can go straight to the barrister oh, okay. so most people decide one route or the other um but you 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 do have certain barristers who will transfer over and become mm. solicitors and and vice versa but solicitors tend to be working in big offices, you know, it's sort of more teamwork. As a barrister here in Ireland, you're self-employed. So I'm self-employed, I'm my own boss and I'm my own business, mm -hmm. which is in many ways great, you know, mm -hmm. but I love the independence of it. And I'm, mm -hmm. like people who know me would say, I'm, I'm very disciplined, you know, and I, I, I sort of, I work well alone. I don't need people around me yeah. to spur me on. Um, and I like that side That's of it. Cool. I like that aspect, there's a lot of freedom, but I suppose, there's a lot of stress that comes with that too. Is it isolating? Uh, it can be, yeah, mm. I'm sure it can be. Um, and particularly over the last 18 months or so, I think it's been isolating for for people. And I think a lot of barristers have struggled, you know, as have most people. Yeah, yeah. like for, for barristers and solicitors, their, their line of work was gone for a bit of time yeah. as well wasn't it w yeah, when it was. we were in lockdown and everything finished and moved remote yeah I like mm -hmm. I, I, it's, it's, it's uh, probably gas but maybe there's a social aspect of actually going into yeah. the court if you're a barrister there is, mm -hmm. there is yeah absolutely yeah. and it's the coffee in the morning with your colleagues you know going into the call over at half past ten seeing what mm -hmm. cases are in the list having mm -hmm. the chat what are you in what's happening yeah. talking in the bar room 
all that disappeared during COVID. Yeah, mm. it's difficult, isn't it? Mm. Do you know, for any would-be students or anybody of the of the age that may be thinking about becoming a barrister or a lawyer, what's it like in college? Like, how many years does it take, and what was the process mm. like? Well, a law degree will take you three years. Yeah. Um, so I studied law in UCC. It was a three-year degree. Um, interesting. Mm. You have various different subjects. You study criminal law, constitutional law, family law, all these different subjects. Um, it's 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 tough, but I think um, you know anybody who wants to do it can do it. I mean, if you've got the drive, yeah, you'll succeed. Uh, what I would say is that it's. It's it's a great uh, degree for anybody to have to have a law degree. You know, it, it would open so many doors for any young person. I think it's hard for younger people now entering the professions and particularly the bar uh, because it's extremely competitive and it's a bit sort of saturated. You know, there are a lot of barristers coming along every year and there just isn't the work to go around. Mm. Um, so it's 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 pretty tough. But what I would say to anybody who wants to do it is. You know, if you've got determination and you've got strength, you know, anything is possible and you yeah. can do it. Yeah, mm. one of the interesting things about law, like through my education, um, which was social sciences for, 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 for the most part, but we did certain law modules along mm -hmm. the way, mm -hmm. and the lawyers who would teach you, it's very different uh, way of writing than it mm -hmm. is in social sciences, and they're not interested in. Um, um, dissecting anything or uh, reflecting on anything or analysing anything it's just the facts of the case mm, black and, and white it's black and white isn't it mm -hmm. but where in social sciences you're taught to be a critical thinker and try to analyse it from this perspective and this yeah. theory and all that but in law is quite different and the language is quite different the, mm -hmm. even the the, even the referencing system was different, you know, it was kind of footnotes and all mm -hmm. these things. So, Bits uh, of Latin thrown in here yeah, and there. Uh, Where would you stand if you were asked to be a barrister for somebody and um, to get them off with a certain thing, God knows it could be anything, and you knew that they were actually wrong, they were lying, would you go over the case? Or is that a really heavy-handed question? That's a very heavy-handed yeah. question. <laughs> it's, um, I'm just looking at the ethical side of it. Ethical. Because yeah, ethical, you have to do your job. You, have you to do, do your have job. to do your job. But what I would say is, yeah, yeah. Your, your, your duty is, is, is yeah. to the court and your duty is to your client. So you, you do the work that comes your way. Mm. Um, I wouldn't find myself in that position to mm. me because yeah. I stay in my own lane. I don't yeah. do I do not do crime. You know, I know what I, I do mm. and I, I do that well. And, you know, with respect. For good I, reason. <laughs> you don't do crime, yeah. so. Yeah. <laughs> no, but um, I know that's it. People, you, you work with the case you've got. And I mean, that's the thing as well. You talk about winning and losing. Mm. A case is only as good as the facts mm. that you have, yeah. you know. And like, this is what I'd say as well to people. It's not about being the best, the brightest, the smartest. You know, when you're a barrister and you have a case, if the facts are in your favour, mm. it doesn't matter how eloquent you are on your feet in court. Mm. you know, you're probably going to win that case for your client. Yeah. Mm. So it's not really all that personal. Mm. Um, and that's why I would encourage anybody who felt that they weren't smart enough or good enough um, yeah. to do it, you know, yeah. just believe in themselves. Yeah. yeah. I, wrote a, I wrote a piece in a book there called Turning Points, and it's mm -hmm. from uh, Hamilton High School in Bandon, if anybody's interested. Mm -hmm. But they're raising money to, for a new AstroTurf pitch. Long story short, anyway, they asked would I write a piece around the turning point in my life, which I did. They were kind enough to send me the book there yeah. around Christmas. When I got the book now, there's about 200 contributions to the book, and I was one, mm -hmm. but one of them was Barry Galvin, probably the most oh, yeah. famous listener in Ireland. But he, he wrote about his turning point, which is directly linked to what Timmy asked you. Mm -hmm. Barry was a defence solicitor in Cork, mm -hmm. so he defended a lot of well-known criminals in Cork in the 80s. That was his job. One case that he wrote about his turning point, Barry now went on to set up the Criminal Assets Cap, Bureau, yeah, among exactly. other things now, like, and he was the first day solicitor to have a gun. Yeah. Um, oh, really? Yeah, but w how did he go into the prosecution side of it? He had these two guys, these two guys were in court, they were brothers, they were after robbing two other brothers that owned a garage, they robbed them for like 20 grand cash. He said back in these days, six grand cash bought your house, so 20 grand cash was a lot of money. And the brothers were arrested at a no road bowling, at a road bowling event with mm. the cash in their pockets. But the defence was they won that money at the road bowling, so that cash could have come from anywhere. 
long story short, anyway, they got off of it. And it was in Dublin. And they were coming home on the train. And the two brothers that got off at the trial were drinking and buying drinks and singing with their family. And Barry was there. And he looked down in the other carriage. And there was the two farmer brothers after being cleaned out, business gone, mm -hmm. lost the case. And then mm -hmm. Barry was like, what am I actually doing here? Yeah. And, yeah. and that's, that was, he switched. It's, yeah. That's yeah, well, doesn't it? Yeah. That's It'd be great to have Barry yeah. on. Talk yeah. about I was it. going to say, do a shout out because it Barry does. is still around. Yeah. Barry was around, and Barry got a lifetime achievement award there a couple of years ago at the Irish Law Awards. He did. Um, he's an amazing character, an amazing figure. Yeah. I think I don't think there'll ever be the likes of him around again. No, yeah, and Ballsy as well, isn't he? Like mm. Ballsy still so fair play to him, and mm. we'd love to have him on. You came on to talk to us about course of control. I don't want to. You know, I know you're a little bit nervous about it. So, do you want to just talk to us about what does it mean? Yeah, exactly. What does it actually maybe, mean? maybe defining it. And mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I came on to talk to you about my book. <laughs> and that too. Yeah. Um, well, look, what I will say is, at the outset, I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. I'm not a social worker. I'm not a guard. I'm not. I'm not an expert in any of this. Um, but I, I have a story. Mm -hmm. um, and I suppose you, you asked me to share it and, and, and yeah. I hopefully will be able to, but uh, coercive control was made a crime here in Ireland um, not so long ago with the Domestic Violence Act 2018. So if it happened after the 1st of January 2019, it is a crime. And coercive control is really the beating heart and soul of domestic violence. So it's everything that happens leading up to that violent act. It's a pattern of behaviour sustained over time by one person to another in an intimate relationship that is designed to undermine them, erode their self-esteem and trap them, essentially. Mm -hmm. And what was it like living in, in that environment? Like, with people, like, there's... And I said it in the last podcast we did there with Mary Crilly, but over 60% of the people that access this podcast are female, so mm. there's huge female following, so mm -hmm. there's people going to be listening to this that's going to be in that situation now yeah. that you used to be in. Can you talk to them or maybe talk to us about what it's like and you know how you managed to get out of it and mm. how you managed to help yourself? Well, I suppose I was very young when I got into this particular relationship. I was 19 and I was a young 19 at that. Um, he was older, he was a good bit older than me and in the beginning everything was just pretty normal, um, exciting. There was something very magnetic about him and you know I was just happy and I suppose in the very early stages there might have been little things. Um, I knew that for example he had a temper, I knew he'd a an issue with anger, and I would have seen that come out on a few occasions. Uh, but I don't know, maybe just I was naive. I, I overlooked it or I excused it. I didn't make an issue of it. Um, but there was definitely something in my gut saying a few times, I don't really like that. Mm -hmm. um, and I had a, a very warm, loving, yeah. sheltered, safe upbringing, you know, I've, I've a fantastic family, I had a great home life, wonderful schooling, you know, and I, I never really had difficulties and I had never, I had never been treated badly actually by anybody, mm. really badly, but it wasn't until about over half a year, I'd say it was six or seven months into the relationship that the line was crossed. And it went from being just slight kind of episodes of anger and slightly controlling things like, for example, why are you wearing that colour on your nails? Why did you paint your nails? Who are you trying to impress going into college? Things like that. Um, wanting to know who was texting me. Wanting to constantly read messages. You know, flipping out if somebody, some other guy added me as a friend on Facebook, you know, that sort of mm, they're all obsession. They're the characteristics of the course control. Yeah, but, but it wasn't until about six or seven months into it that the line was actually crossed. And I remember very vividly that night, it was a January night like this, 
was a cold, dark night. Um, and I had spent a few days with him. I had spent, I don't know, three or four days and nights with him. He was living in County Cork at that stage and I was living still at home. So I'd been a few days with him. We were in his car outside a supermarket um, at about seven, seven or eight o'clock that evening. There weren't many people around. We were having an argument because I wanted to go home and he wanted me to stay another night. And the next thing I knew, he just leant across to the passenger seat where I was. He had his hands around my neck and he slammed the left hand side of my face and head forcefully and repeatedly against the door, the window of the car. Like so many times I lost count. Uh, just slammed and then without a word he just turned the key in the ignition and drove off very fast and silence and he brought me home but I remember sitting in the car on the passenger seat just totally numb and thinking what just happened um, and it was immediately followed up with I am so sorry I didn't mean for this to happen I would never want to hurt you. You drove me to this. Mm. You wound me up. I just, you know, as if it was my fault. But I remember going to bed that night and my head on the pillow, the temple being sore. I woke up the next day and I saw him again. And I think that was like, do you know, I had handed over my power at that point and I had given him a message that it was okay to do what he had done and I was going to stand for that um, yeah and it just it just went on it continued and it actually continued for almost five years and I'm 32 now I was 19 meeting him and when I look back now it's I don't recognise the person I was mm. I look back and it's like you know a few years they're just like one big dark, hazy fog of just slaps and bruises and fear and anxiety and lots of tears. Did you ever go to a family member or a friend? I didn't go to anybody as such. Um, a lot of my friends would have seen glimpses, bits and pieces. Mm. Um, I think there was a lot of shame as well, you know. I was in university, I was studying law. And while everybody else was out kind of, you know, clubbing on a Thursday night, I was living this existence, which wasn't even an existence. And, you know, looking back now, like I was learning things like I was actually learning about resilience and I was gaining some strength, but I just didn't have a life because I was totally isolated from everybody and I think that's a pattern that happens in situations like this. He didn't like me spending time with people in college. He didn't like me spending time with my friends that I would have had from school. He didn't like me going to anything, doing any activities. And so, you know, my world just became sort of smaller yeah. and smaller and smaller and it was just us. And everyone else was the problem. At a, like at any point, did you blame yourself for what was happening? Did what, did you think, oh, there must be something wrong with me, or, or anything like that, or did you realise what was going on was wrong? Mm -hmm. You know, did you feel trapped in the relationship? Was it your first relationship? Was it your first love? You know, did you feel that you needed to be there? You know, and. Um, because I know if you were young at the time, it could have been your first relationship uh, or whatever. And um, to get that much love from somebody in the first relationship, to feel that you're wanted so much at the beginning and then for something like that to happen, you're afraid then to lose that person because you're going to lose the attachment to love. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I think no, when, you're, when you're so young in toxic relationships, yeah. you know, when you're so young, you don't really have much experience to draw upon. Mm -hmm. So there might be an almost, is this how adults actually are? Yeah. 
Yeah. Like, was there a piece of that, or what? Like, what kind of you you were in it for five years? Like, was it just maturity? Mm-hmm. You got mature, and then you began to realise it was wrong, mm-hmm. and then you got out. So. I think I knew it was wrong all along, but you know, there's so many layers to that question. Yeah. It's really interesting the point you make. I mean, it's 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 so hard when it's somebody that you think you love and that you think loves you, and then that they're behaving like this. Um, and so I think you're stuck in a cycle and you you want to believe that it's going to work out. And yeah, it was actually, it was my first serious yeah. relationship and I wanted things to work out. And I, I, I kept thinking, you know, that it will change and it will get better. And I think to an extent as well, I did believe the lines of you drove me to it, you wound me up, um, you provoked me, you know? Mm. Like, there was some, it was always my fault that I had said the wrong thing or I had I had done something wrong. And, but like, you're treading on eggshells all of the time. And I actually, I feel as if I went around, there was a knot constantly in my stomach. Um, if and when I did meet friends, I, I, I'd be honestly like watching over my shoulder because he would just appear out of nowhere. And then all of the destruction, I mean, like, do you remember those phones that you used to flip up mm. the, whatever the you call them? Things flip or was them, it a yeah. Samsung? Whatever. Mm. I had one of those anyway. And I remember in the car one night, yeah, I, I think it beeped or a text came in and he just reached over and he snapped that phone in two. And it was always stuff like that, like, Mm. you know, he used to tear my clothes, like he used to, like, break the handles of handbags, just things like that. It was just total destruction. Mm. Um, Controlling as well. But constantly, constantly an apology. I'm so, I love you so much. Um, And I think... Yeah, there's many reasons why people stay, but that's the thing I would like to know the answer to, really. I mean, I look back and some people have said to me, why didn't you just leave him? Why did you stay in that for so long? And I hate that question because... There's no easy answer. There's no easy answer, but it's like, it's like that's not the question either. Like, the question is, how did you leave? Because I tried to leave... That's good. That's, a dozen that's times. A good question. I actually did. Mm-hmm. And... You know, I'm sure that people would relate to this, that, you know, you you say that you're going to leave and, you, you you know, you put that in words and then you're getting a threat. Mm. You get a threat to yourself yeah. or your property or your family or something mm. like that. But when you you when you can see what a person is capable of... You know, it's not when an they, idle yeah, threat. Yeah. When they make threats like that, however crazy and off the wall they might seem, you actually believe they're capable of it because you've seen what they're capable of. Does it take of. something really, really bad to happen before you get the courage to leave? Or does it take your family members to find out about it, to drag you out of the relationship? There's mm-hmm. so many different ways that it can happen, you know? Yeah, but like very insidious as well, I suppose. Like it's it was very, as I said, friends would have seen glimpses now in bits and pieces, but I don't really think anybody knew the full extent of what was going on. And sure, like, I wouldn't, I couldn't have told anybody. Yeah. I couldn't. Um, you know, so, like, there was... Will you get any any help from a counsellor during, during all this? Were you speaking to any friend? I thought back on that, you know, yeah. and, like, I didn't even have a GP to go to. Yeah. Literally, mm. back then, I didn't. And if I, I remember needing or want, you know, literally, like, he would say, I'll get that from the doctor. If you, you know, I did not, I thought of that and I thought, God, yeah, maybe if I'd gone to the doctor, this would have kind of spilled out, you know. Um, but I didn't. And I am, you know, I suppose I was a private person and I suppose there's, there's that thing of kind of shame as well. Like, you don't want... I didn't want people to realise how chaotic my life was, so I felt like I was trying to keep up this front of everything's fine. Mm. You know, I'm doing grand, I'm studying in university, I have this this partner, but, you know, I would have been absolutely broken if people had realised what it was actually like. Mm. And the thing is that it was all 
nearly all behind closed doors because when I think back on all of the really bad episodes they were all either at home behind the closed door or in the car you know when there was nobody around they were always either at home or in the car they wouldn't have happened you know in the middle of people in the middle of a gathering mm. um, so that, that takes the impulse excuse away then doesn't it or it's just the reaction you made me risk this yeah. talk with it because it always seems to happen yeah. when nobody's around so that's control but also then. James it's interesting I thought like and that you'd always have a punch at the back of the head these you know are, if it's impulsive yeah. yeah but I remember you know this one time that stands out because it was uh, outside I suppose like we were sitting in his car on a summer's day up at the top of is it Patrick's Hill or mm. Carr's Hill the, the, the no dark, what's the other hill there by Bellsfield Richmond Hill Richmond Hill and we were sitting in, in, in the car and again I don't know what happened but an argument broke out and broad daylight it was July or something like that in the middle of the day and literally within a split second he just punched me right into the the forehead here above above my right eyebrow pushed me out of the car uh, I had a small little bag that was in the car he went off at speed leaving me on the side of the road at the top of the hill somebody actually had a skip outside their house you know one of these mm -hmm. blue bin things with furniture in it um, he stopped the car threw my bag into the skip and continued driving down the hill and just left in a ball of smoke. I was hysterical. I went and retrieved the bag. My phone was gone out of the bag, of course. Um, and I remember I ran down the hill. I ran through town. I remember running, running across those side streets, across the Mall onto um, Parliament Street, and there's a pub there. And there was a guy outside the pub, I don't know, with a pint, and... At this stage now, I had a very big swelling here. It was like mm. very big. And he said, are you okay? And I went in, I actually went inside the door of the pub at that stage because he had my phone, he was in the car and I knew he was gonna be driving around like a maniac. And I, I couldn't be you know, seen standing outside talking. So I went into this pub, I was hysterical, I was crying. And I remember the man saying, what happened to you? Who did this? Do you need help? Will I ring a guard? I said, no, 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 no. And I was adamant. I said, like, I just need to get home. I just need to go home. And I remember he had, you know, those hats. Is it Humphrey Bogart mm -hmm. would wear? And Johnny Depp, you know, the kind of, is it a fedora? I don't know what it's called. Yeah. He had a black hat anyway. And um, he took the hat off. And he just, I, I put the hat on my head. And I remember running from there home. Because um, I couldn't go in, I couldn't go into the house with that mm. visible. Uh, and I don't know who that man was. And it's the little things like that I often think about. Where is he now? Who is he? I never gave him his hat back, you know? Mm. It's, it's other human beings doing simple, small things like that. You know, really gives you mm. that insight into how good people genuinely are. Yeah. You know, um, and it's the that act of kindness, like that you might never know. Like my, I talk about a few a few times. You know, the, the guy that, that found me overdosed and they said mm. instead of questioning me where I was, was like, you need to mind yourself, Jim. You look after yeah. yourself. You never know what impact the world could have at the right time. You know, mm -hmm. and. Maybe that guy is watching, do you know what I mean? And, and maybe he remembers, but fair play to him. There were lots of, yeah, he stands out of my mind now, but there were, there were, there were people like that. Thanks, Ron. There mm -hmm. were people like that, you know, there were moments like that. Um, and they're the things you remember, you know? Yeah. They're the things you remember. And so I like, I'd be very acutely aware of that, you know, like you never know what's going on for a person mm -hmm. on any given day. And so just, just be kind, you know. I like he was kind to me that day. Yeah. How did you get out of the relationship? Um, well, as I said, I, like there were a number of attempts to sort of 
finish it or and, and to get out. Um, and I'm just thinking there now. I remember at one stage, I, I, I like, you know, you always think that's it. This is it now. It's the rock bottom. I'm mm -hmm. getting out now. I remember on one occasion saying that he, you know, that was it. It was over. But I and I, I called to the house because there was some stuff there, you know, clothing or whatever. And um, and I called to collect my stuff late one evening, and uh, he just went apoplectic, and. Uh, he said your stuff is gone. I burnt it with the rubbish out the back. Yeah. And you know, he was he was going wild because because of the fact that I had called late in the evening, you know, that was the thing he hung on to. How can you call at this time of the evening? Um and took my car keys, threw them up on top of a dresser and again just proceeded to that was, you know, I remember he put he put a cushion over my head, put a cushion over my face, and that was one of the the times I actually thought he 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 probably could accidentally mm. kill me here. You that know, must have been frightening. You kind of do see, mm. um, and it was like in that moment you just think, like you actually, it's like in that moment you think, God, oh, there are actually people who love me. I actually have a family. There are people actually who care about me. And when you think to you know that that's happening, that all flashes before you. But it, it, that wasn't the end of it, sorry. To come yeah. back to the question, that wasn't the end of it. Um, what happened was, I suppose I reached a stage in the winter of 2010, 11, two very bad things happened. And, you know, I had two sort of serious losses, which I, I don't really want to go into. But yeah. I just, I, I realised that I, I, I wasn't able to leave him that he was always going to be here and any time that I tried to leave his behaviour would get worse and the threats would get more severe and so I thought I I have to leave Cork and I thought if I actually get out of the city this thing will come to a natural end um, he'll find someone else or he'll lose interest like the geographic yeah. distance will just organically bring it to a close so that's when I decided to to go, and I did, and I, I moved, that was around the time I moved up to Dublin. In the middle of all this, like I was studying hard, I, I, that was when I um, I sat the entrance exams for King's Inns to be, to do the bar training course. Um, and again, I remember like, my self-esteem was through the floor. Mm -hmm. I thought I was the worst in the world, yeah. and I did not tell anybody that I was sitting those exams because I was so convinced I was going to fail them. Mm. And I remember the mortification, I, you had to get two um, references or declarations signed or whatever from people of good standing. So I remember having to go and ask two people would they sign this just so I could sit these exams. And like even being embarrassed to even say that, that's how little I thought of mm. myself, you know, I was ashamed to even say I'm thinking of sitting these exams you know um, Would your self esteem and confidence would have been would, would, would it have been very high before no, it this wouldn't relationship have been. I, I would were have you just quiet I would have said I never really had much confidence but yeah. this really eroded whatever confidence I had and if you're constantly being told you're this, you're that, you're the other you know, if that tape is just constantly playing in your mind, you start to believe it. Mm. That's the messaging you're getting all the time. And there was a lot of cruelty as well. And without minimising any kind of physical abuse that anybody else has gone through, what I would say is that nothing compared for me to the actual mental torture of some of the things that he said and some of the threats that he made. You know, that I actually cannot even repeat. I wouldn't repeat. Yeah. Um, but so I sat those exams. I passed them. I don't know how. And I remember going up to Dublin with my suitcase and my few bottles of Tanora and <laughs> thinking, like, no, this is me now. Fresh I've made down. it. New start. Absolutely new. This is my mm. new life. And little did I know, it just... It wasn't. He went nowhere. 
and if anything, he became more paranoid and more kind of obsessive because I was up there and I was mixing with people and I was doing something positive and I was moving on with my life and I actually think he could see that he was sort of losing control. Yeah. But I, I, I mean, any time I would go out, I remember the phone would just ring and ring and ring and ring to the point that the battery would die. And then sometimes he would just land up in Dublin. He would drive up from Cork. So it was like that was always going on. And again, I was trying to maintain this aura of normality with the people that I was studying with and everything's fine. And, you know, it wasn't like it was just mm. utter misery. Um, and I got through that year and July 2012, I was called to the bar. So it would be 10 years actually this year. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Well I don't feel that old, but um, it would be 10 years. But I remember, um, so I started working. I started, I, I was practicing from 2012 and like he was still there. And how it actually ended is strange because it wasn't like there was one final terrible act. There wasn't. Um, what happened was, to my mind anyway, he crossed the line. He crossed the line. He did something that involved my family and putting fear and worry into them. And I was questioned about it afterwards. And that was, that was the first time I actually said to my family, I'm completely broken. I cannot end this and I can't get out of it. I need help. And there was an intervention. Um, and that worked. And, and that worked. So you needed somebody to intervene at some point. There was an intervention. To take you away. Mm -hmm. And whoever that person was, they were able to stop it. Mm -hmm. Good. I don't know if, there was, if there's uh, girls in your in that situation now. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you would have done differently? Is there anything any... Do you ever look back and analyse it? Um, maybe have you got some wisdom from your experiences mm. that you think might help somebody in the situation? No? I definitely, I wouldn't say wisdom, but yeah, I, it's taught me a lot. Yeah. I mean, um, it's a life experience, you know, and I suppose I've chosen to not talk about it and sort of put it to one side mm -hmm. to a large extent. And I've also made a decision to, to have a bit of forgiveness around it because yeah. just for me personally, um, you know, it's twofold. Like, I, I just believe in forgiveness, but also I don't want to be carrying that burden, that load. But I do think the advice I would give to somebody is when there are red flags in the early stages, do not ignore them mm. because I ignored them. And it only ever got worse. And the more you become entrenched and involved with somebody like this, the harder it is going to be to get away. And I know now that the United Nations actually say less than 40% of people who are in a violent or abusive relationship like this ever seek help of any kind. Mm. There was a survey done here several years ago as well. Um, like people do not report this to the guards. Most of these instances, you know, they just, they don't for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. People minimize it. They, they, they start to think that they're imagining it or they think that they're the problem, that it's their fault. Yeah. They think that they might not be believed. They think that it's not maybe as serious as something else. But well, it is a crime. Yeah. It might just become the norm at some mm -hmm. point and they, they just might go over it. But if you you're, know? if you're uh, like, if your friends are married and you perceive them to be happily married, yeah. it's something that you might be embarrassed about as well, you know? But this is the yeah. thing, and like, what I feel is I'm here, I'm not telling a story that is in any way unusual or sensational mm. or unique or rare, because actually I do think that this is people's daughters, sisters, mothers and friends. Mm -hmm. Like, it is widespread and rampant and but it's not spoken about it. It's not. As much. No. I think it's starting to be. Like, but it, because it, it will. 
because it, people like you have broken the silence in a way and a lot of the stuff you spoke about there a lot of people males and females might not understand that these all these different things that were happening to you are a part of controlling somebody you know uh, they mightn't understand it and it's giving them an opportunity to maybe look at it and ask themselves like why am I going along with this you know because um, it is nothing this is made it's a big big deal you know for somebody to take control of your life you like mentioned that. control there twice and like yeah. you really are hitting the nail on the head because it is all about control and power um, and as I said, I don't have the answers. I don't have the solutions. But I do think that there is more of a conversation opening up about it now. Is there a group in Cork for people that have gone through similar things to you? There are a lot of supports is out there? there. Apart from Women's Aid, there's Manal Fasa in Cork. There's the OSS on North Main Street. Um, there's each other house, there's countless. Mm. Um, there's there's Safe Ireland do a lot, so there is a lot of help. There are there there are phone lines people can ring. There's men all of that. Men overcoming violence is another one. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Because this is the thing. Too. It's not just mm. male to female. It's yeah. it's it, it's it's in all relationships, yeah. and and it's in all walks of life. You know, it doesn't matter your gender, your educational status, your sh- your social status, whatever. This is everywhere. Yeah. It is absolutely everywhere. I know and someone off the top of my head right now in a course of control situation where he's being completely dominated and completely controlled to the mm-hmm. point where he can't go outside the door. You know? Um, and people, if you're in that situation and you're a man, that might be very embarrassing to admit that to yourself. Mm-hmm. So you might just sold run like that and take that abuse yeah. be treated yeah. like a dog for a very long time if you get out of it at all so if you're in that situation there is support there for you too um, some of the organisations that we mentioned you know pick up the phone mm-hmm. and you deserve better you know if people are in that relationship you deserve better you're like, very brave to speak about this stuff yeah. Yeah. thanks for sharing your story with us I know it's not easy I know you were nervous mm-hmm. You spoke, re- you spoke really well. I'm used to asking the questions, you know. I know. Uh, not answering them. But, but you, you, you answered a lot of the good... Uh, I think a lot of our questions very, very well. Very, you know. And people will find it very beneficial. Yeah. yeah, I hope so. But I think as well to involve men, mm. uh, like I'm here with three men, you are. And, yeah. um, but to involve men in the conversation too. Um, and like, you know, it's like anything... You know, so many people say, yeah, this is a problem, but this is just the way men are. Or, you know, there'll always be violence in relationships and there'll always be domestic violence or whatever. I don't think that's good enough. And I do think that where there's a will to change, there's a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you go back 20, 30 years ago, like drink driving was acceptable. People did it. Smoking in the house. Well, exactly. Smoking (laughs) on the train, all that kind of stuff. You know, now if people do that, you're called out on it. What are you doing? Mm-hmm. You know, you can't do that. Yeah. Why can't we have it so that in 10 years' time, people have been called out on this? Yeah. Do you know? Well, it starts now. Mm. I think, I think in, in general, across the board, in, in life in general, I think because of social media, which is one of the good things, mm-hmm. a, a lot of the good side of the social media is this talking about stuff talking about these issues talking about gives all gives us a platform doesn't it exactly and, and, and it shows other people too that you're not the only person with this this happened to me I can relate to you what did you do you're telling us what you've done maybe these people will do the same thing mm-hmm. you know maybe they'll seek help in some of the organisations we spoke about there mm-hmm. that's what this is about you know, and, and sometimes I, yeah. we have to look at above ourselves at the bigger picture. You know, we might feel a bit of anxiety talking about our story, a bit of shame, a bit of fear, mass fear. You know, but it was like when I done my story at the beginning, I knew that it wasn't about me. Mm-hmm. I knew I wasn't doing this for any fame or yeah. make myself this bigger or whatever. I was doing it for the reasons we're still here. 
Mm. You know, and mm. the reason you're here is to talk about your story mm. because it will help. Because you're 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 the voice, and we're the voice for people that aren't in that position. Maybe they're, they're not mm. strong enough, or they have. We're we're the voice for the voiceless. The voice for the voiceless. Um, and like that's the thing. But anyone listening, everybody has a voice, mm. but they just need to feel empowered to use it, exactly. and they need to be yeah. listened to. And that's why I think what you're doing here is really great, you know? And I wish that there had been something like this when I was 19, 20. Yeah. Um, do you know? Um, but we are, I think we're moving in the right direction. And I think even guards, everything, I think there's more um, understanding nowadays about these issues. And I think that, um, you know, there, there's less tolerance. Mm, and yeah. I think there's less tolerance, but there should be zero tolerance because there's no excuse for abuse and it doesn't matter what kind of abuse it is, physical, emotional, sexual, yeah. financial, it's all different types of abuse. Yeah. Um, but there is no excusing abuse. Yeah. Mm. You, you had a book released recently, it's around the coroner's court and inquest and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I wonder, would you be interested in coming back for a second appearance? Because I think that we could give that more than 10 minutes. Oh yeah. God, James, my nerves. <laughs> <laughs> uh, it would be a shame to fly through that because I think that's a topic in yeah. and of itself what do you think? yeah absolutely yeah. Brilliant. So um, you can plug my other book as well Medical Negligence and Childbirth oh really? <laughs> you have two books? well it's free really technically I brought a book out in 2015 yeah. went into the second edition this time last year and now I have the book on Inquest so yeah three so you'll definitely come back so for a second episode yeah. so we, we'll bring you back in a couple of weeks Thanks, it's been a pleasure talking to you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Really well and a very and difficult topic. And it's been requested over the last 18 months. Mm. It was just very difficult to get the right person to command for a lot of reasons, not yeah. least the safety mm. and all that. So thank you. And we Thank see you in the Opera House in a couple of weeks. Absolutely. <laughs> Front row seats. Thank you. <laughs> see you later, everybody. Bye.